So whether these guys are doing it wittingly or unwittingly, of course, is, is perhaps the great unknown. Um, but, you know, perhaps on the, on the greater scheme of things, because, uh, you know, there's more things on heaven and earth than in your, my philosophy, Horatio. Exactly. Um, to right. You know, so let, let's, uh, let's recognize that that is a tremendous, um, you know, possibility. And that's why it's important that we do what we do, which is trying to encourage people to take a look at things for themselves, to come to their own realization. Mm-hmm. And I love that word, realization. Let's break it down. Real eyes. <laughs> real eyes. You know, you're looking at things through real eyes. Not somebody because else. that, you know, that's why the truth cannot be told. The truth can never be told. You know, the truth has to be realized by each individual for themselves. And, and our role, or the role that we have uh, taken on, is simply to try and sow seeds and, uh, and, and hope that some of those seeds will fall on sort of fertile land and, uh, you know, that people will pursue their own lines of investigation exactly. and come to their own realization of, of what's going on. And, of course, once, they, once the veil is lifted in one area, then that's it. There's no turning back. And in most cases, you know, very soon the, uh, the construct that they thought was reality sort of falls down like the proverbial house of cards. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we... Um it's something I spoke to with a couple of our previous guests, especially um, the last guest, who was um, Karen Sawyer, who I spoke to. And I brought up an article that was in um, <clears throat> Dot Connector magazine when she was the editor back in November 2009. And I think it was, um, I think I might even have it here. It's an article written by um, someone I'm not familiar with called Bronte Baxter. And it was an article called um, Thinking Long Thoughts. And what it was saying is don't use the, the, the public, the people visible in the public in, in this alternative, or I'll call it the truth movement, don't use them as your truth. Take it all in, listen to what they've got to say, but whatever you do, don't start worshipping the idols. Don't, don't simply follow what they say blindly. Make your own Absolutely. Mind- Follow your own heart. You absolutely must do that. I, I couldn't agree more. In fact, you know, that's why, you know, I, I say in, uh, in most of my presentations that, you know, I would be mortified if people literally just took what I said and, and uh, requoted it, you know, because that's not their truth. It's, it might be my truth, but okay. it's not their truth. And, and, you know, what, what's really important is that people do do their own research and you know come to their own um, their own conclusions and, and, and I don't have an existential commitment to any particular philosophy because you know I am a perennial student I'm sorry. and I'm absorbing new data new information new intuition whatever on an ongoing basis and you know I hold many many pieces of a jigsaw that I still don't know where those pieces fit in That's it. and so consequently, you know, I don't mention those pieces of the jigsaw because right now they're just abstract. But then as time goes on, of course, and we're searching and we're looking and, um, and of course, it's amazing the way that information sort of appears to come to us at exactly the right moment. That's it. Um, and then as time goes on, you know, other pieces of the jigsaw fall into place. But, you know, this is what is, is so critical. And, and I absolutely concur with that observation. Um, you know, it is not about um, anyone who's uh, taken the, the platform to, to share their observation. I mean, I just work on the basis that, you know, I have the luxury, and I've had the luxury for 10 years to devote my time to my relearning process. That's it, yeah. And, um, and, I, and I recognize that, and I'm very grateful for it. Um, but it would, be, it would be extremely selfish of me to some extent, if I just sort of said, well, okay, I know what's going on, I'm happy with the deal, and um, I'll, now I'll go and play golf. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, and in fact, that's, I mean, to some extent, that's what I was doing initially. Yeah. Um, and it was actually one of my close friends in, uh, who was very well aware of the research that I was doing on 9-11. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and actually, I mean, he, he thought I was just, you know, way out of, out of line. I mean, he thought 9-11 occurred exactly as per the official version of events. And, 
you know, I said to him, I said, Lee, I said, look, mate, I don't want to fall out with you on something like this, but let's just agree to differ, you know, because I said, I've researched this, you haven't. Um, I've spent 18 months researching this. You think you know what happened. I have no clue what happened. Yeah. You know, because the more I look at this, the more the physical evidence actually just leaves more and more questions open, which aren't answered by the official version of events. Now, if you choose to you know, believe the official version of events, then that's your prerogative. Anyway, he came by my house um, you know, probably about six, nine months later, and I, he saw a DVD laying there, and it was actually Dave Von Kleist's DVD, In Plain Sight. Ah, this is the one that was on uh, Sky recently on, on Twitter, exactly. wasn't it? Yeah, it was. And, and um, uh, he picked it up. And I said, Lee, you know, you don't want to watch that, mate. I said, uh, it, you know, because it'll just give you apoplexy. <laughs> I said, just leave, just leave it. Anyway, he, he took it. And about, si- I'd forgotten about it, but about six weeks later, um, he and his wife uh, came around to, to dinner. And we had a few other friends around for dinner. Anyway, during the dinner, his wife nudged him. And she said, Lee, haven't you got something you want to say to Ian? <laughs> and he said, later, later, later. And she said, no, no, tell him now, tell him now. <laughs> and so he said, um, yeah, you know all that stuff you've been doing about 9-11? I said, yeah. He said, you're absolutely bloody right. He said, it was an inside job, and you need to be getting out there and sharing what you know. And he actually he actually financed, he booked the first three venues I spoke at. All right. He paid for all the publicity. And, um, uh, and uh, you know, I spoke to you know, relatively small audiences, I don't know, probably 20 people or whatever at each one. But it was a start. And, that, uh, and from that, of course, I was the first person in the UK. Yeah. Uh, this is 2003, I think. I was the first person in the UK. Um, it was January 2004. And I think I was the first person to actually be hit on the streets in the UK giving talks about the, uh, the events of 9-11. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, of course, 18 months later, we had the London bombings, and uh, and that was the catalyst, I think, for bringing a number of people together in the UK who had all been looking at 9/11, but all doing it independently. And then, very shortly after that, of course, we established the uh, UK 9/11 Truth Movement, which I chaired. I was the inaugural chairman for for 18 months, but oh, um, which yeah. was education in itself. But that's another that's another story. Um, and of course now, you know, the beauty is, I mean, the fact that, you know, we're on, we're doing what we're doing right now. Mm. But the beauty is there are more and more and more people across all age ranges now asking all the right questions, looking at these issues, you know, and, and not just one issue because it's no longer about 9-11. It's no longer about the London bombings. They are very, very important issues. And invariably, of course, I always broach on these issues yeah. in my talks, but it's about so much more. Okay. You know, the, the, the complete collapse of the, the financial system. I mean, as you guys have been talking about um, um, unemployment, you know, particularly in the Northeast. What we can do is we'll, we, we'll, touch on, we'll, we'll touch back on 9-11 a little bit after the break and definitely talk about what's going on in the Northeast. That would be great because I know you're, um, you're due up here soon. We can get into that. Um, we're going to take a quick break, folks. Um, um, if, there's a lot of um, activity going on in the Freeman Island chat room. <laughs> those of you listening there if you've got any questions come 10 o'clock we'll try and delve into some of those um, the last song was Jeff Buckley The Sky is a Landfill before the break we were talking um, we touched on um, how people sort of got started with getting out there and on the streets and doing presentations and we talked about 9-11 yeah. something that we were talking about maybe 20 minutes ago was um, the possibility that certain um, societies or fraternal orders are creating events um, negatively, events that would be normally seen as negative and increase a lot of um, suffering, but the possibility that they are created to help us awaken as well. The 9-11 and the Patriot Act is probably um, the biggest example I can think of in, in recent times that has helped create um, a, a sort of awakening, if you like, um, which... I mean, the whole truth movement falls on the back of the 9-11 truth movement, so um, it can definitely be seen as a, as a massive, massive trigger that would back up that opinion. So it's a possibility, it's something to think about, but, I mean, Ian, you, you mentioned how you got started sort of spreading your message out there to the public, and mm-hmm. 9-11 was what you, what, you know, was the first thing you chose. I think it was the same for most people, but... Um, 
some questions that I've noticed coming in, and it's it's something I've wondered as well. Um, people are often accused of using um, the movement to make money. People who put on presentations who obviously have to charge. I mean, what you you must get this a lot. I mean, what, what how do you what do you say to people that, that that give these questions in in relation to how you actually started? Um, well, first of all, I mean, let's recognise that um, the away team, if you like have all the resources at their disposal. They have, you know, all the money, all the time, all the resources, um, and, you know, we're operating literally on the proverbial shoestring. Yep. And, and it is a shoestring. I mean, I had somebody talk to me today, somebody phoned me up today offering their services to help us. Um, as And, uh, you know, it, I have realized sort of during the conversation that actually the call was commercially oriented and not um, just support oriented. Yep. And, and this person said, uh, eventually I asked the question, of course, and she said, well, you know, actually I'm very, very cheap. Um, I normally look to charge about £350 a day. <laughs> and I went, you know what? I said the vast majority of people who work in this particular genre would be ecstatic if they could get £350 in a week. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> now, first, there's two things here. There's a lot of people in the truth movement, and, and I'm going to couch what I say as diplomatically as I possibly can, mm -hmm. because I appreciate that, uh, you know, people's circumstances, um, um, you know, are changeable. But, you know, one of the things that does concern me and has always concerned me is the number of people who um, are part of the truth movement, if you like, but rely for their income on benefits. Yeah. Now, the fastest way that they can be shut down is just to have their benefits cut or withdrawn. <coughs> so, you know, we have to be able to function independently. Now, initially, um, you know, I, I basically, uh, you know, used all the resources that I had accumulated, you know, from my, uh, my days in the oil industry. Um, and, you know, what I've tried to do is obviously supplement that with things like DVD sales, yeah. Um, and, and, you know, it's a, it's a nominal income. I mean, I'm not, you know, not selling blockbusters. Um, you know, we still got the cost of production. I don't have the time to do the production, so I have to pay somebody to do the production of the DVD, to do the distribution of the DVD. Yeah. I have to pay somebody to, you know, look after my accounts and my basic administration. Um, and uh, then, because I'm not uh, an artist or a filmmaker, I need to have somebody, effectively, who I can pay to do that. And, and these people yeah. all do what they And my webmaster. Yeah. I mean, these people all do what they do for, it, on an hourly rate, way below minimum wage. Yeah, when you look at yeah, it, how many hours... They're actually more. putting more hours in than I'm paying them for, for sure. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, this, this, is, this is not for the faint-hearted by any stretch of the imagination. And, and the arrangement for my talks, by the way, is very, very simple. Um, and I will speak wherever you know people feel they can get um, um, a, a group together, um, provided my travelling expenses are covered. A lot of the time, I mean, if the weather's warm, um, I camp or I sleep in my van, and so I keep the expenses to an absolute minimum. I mean, it's basically down to fuel and um, and you know contribution to the meals that I have to eat while I'm away. Yeah. yeah. The the only the only surplus, if you like, is generally um, um, from the DVD sales that I, I make at the event. Now, if if you know the, we we are looking at an event and uh, it's a joint promotion, if there is any surplus, mm -hmm. once all the expenses are paid, and of course the person organising the event has to pay for the room, has to pay for you know probably flyers to be printed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, so they've got expenses too. So mo most of the time there is no surplus, but if there is a surplus, then I literally split that 50-50 with the person that organised the event. That's good. And, yeah. and and obviously I do that because I want the person who's organised the event, hopefully, to have some seed capital to maybe have the confidence to run another event. 